Okay, so now I'm going to get to the most challenging part of today's class, which is the statistical aspect of a clinical trial. And to do that, we have to talk about three things, size, power, and cost. Size and power are statistical concepts that some of you may have seen in your introductory quantitative methods course like DMD. Uh, how many people have uh, ever already seen a discussion of size, power, hypothesis testing? Okay, great. Uh, for those of you who haven't, uh, I'll give you a quick review, uh, but there are notes on this as well, so you're welcome to take a look at, at your leisure. So the example I'm going to start with is the simplest possible example. It's an example of a balanced two-arm randomized clinical trial. This is the case where you have two end patients, n of them in the control group, n of them in the treatment group. And we're going to assume that we're going to look at a drug that has some kind of a continuous effect that we can quantitatively measure. So a blood pressure medicine that reduces blood pressure. We can measure blood pressure. It's a continuous variable or we're trying to shrink the tumor so we can measure tumor size or tumor growth rates, okay? There are other kinds of trials where you're looking just at zero or one, you know, success or failure. Did you have a stroke or didn't you have a stroke? But for now, I want to keep it simple, and actually continuous variables turn out to be a little bit simpler given what you're used to and the kind of statistics you've already been exposed to. So I've got these two groups, a treatment group and a control group, and I'm going to measure the response for each of the groups and call this response Ti for the treatment group variable, uh, where I is the individual. And here, the control group, their response is going to be x sub i. And i goes from 1 to n. We've got n patients in each of the two groups. And the mean response rate for those in the treatment group is mu sub t. The mean response for those in the control group is mu sub x. And they've got certain variance sigma that I'm going to assume the variance sigma squared is constant across both samples, just to keep it simple. And the object of the clinical trial is nothing more nor less than to figure out whether mu sub t is equal to mu sub x. That's it. We just want to know, are they different? And just to be concrete, let's suppose that whatever it is that we're measuring is a good thing, so we want it to be as big as possible. So for concreteness, let's suppose that we want the effect to be positive, OK? We want the treatment group to show a bigger number than the control group, whatever that number is, just for sake of argument. We could have obviously done it any other way, but that's just a normalization for sake of argument. OK. So the null hypothesis, the base case scenario, is there's no effect. The drug does not work. The alternative hypothesis is the drug works. There's a positive effect. And that's what we're trying to tell. How do we decide between H0 and H1? Now, I think most of you have had hypothesis testing, so you sort of know the drill, right? You construct a confidence interval, and then you calculate your estimate of delta. And if that estimate is inside the confidence interval around 0, then there's no effect. But if it's outside the confidence interval, then you reject the null hypothesis, and you conclude, yes, the drug is effective, OK? So that's the challenge. And the way that we take on that challenge is to construct a simple mean. We calculate these effects across all of the people in the treatment group and in the control group, average them, and take the difference. And if the difference of the averages is greater than 0, statistically, we then have a new drug. And if it doesn't, then we don't. So the key to all of this, the key to the process of evaluating a drug is to evaluate the statistics. Statistics play a huge role in this case. And that's actually a good thing, because we then have a language to talk about this. And more importantly, for our purposes in this class, we actually have a language to talk about the risk. And eventually, that's going to translate into the financial risk of drug development, which we can then manage once we understand the statistics of this process. So this is how we do it. This is how all of you do it in terms of hypothesis testing. You take that estimated mean, this delta hat. That's a random variable, right? And the random variable has a distribution. Once you know the distribution, you can calculate that confidence interval and then do your test. And typically, the way we do this is we normalize 
that estimate, we subtract the mean and divide by its standard deviation, and we whisper a few incantations, and somehow that's magically a normal random variable with mean zero and standard deviation one. And then we construct a confidence interval that says, since we're looking at positive effects, if the statistic is greater than some critical level C, if it's greater than that, then it can't possibly come from the null distribution. We reject the null. And if it isn't greater than C, if it's less than or equal to C, then we don't, ex we don't reject. We accept the null hypothesis. There's no effect. Okay. And typically, what do we choose for C, for the confidence interval, for a standard normal 0, 01? The number 1.96 sound familiar to you? You've probably heard that more than once, right? We choose that number because that is the 95% confidence interval for a two-sided confidence band, right? Minus 1.96 to plus 1.96. That captures 95% of the distribution of this random variable. And so if it's outside of that band, that's when we reject the null hypothesis. And since we're looking for positive effects, we only use the upper tail. If it's above the 97.5 percentile, we then reject. Okay. So this is the picture that you've all seen in your introductory statistics classes. Here's the null hypothesis, mean zero, drug has no effect, and the distribution is given by the standard deviation of the patient population. So the standard deviation of the null hypothesis is going to be driven by the standard deviation of delta hat, which is going to be sigma divided by square root of n, right? That's the, the mean difference. We pick this particular uh, 1.96 as our critical threshold. And so if we observe an estimated difference that's here, we reject the null. And if we don't, if it's in here, we accept the null. And so that's type 1 error, the false positive under the null hypothesis. Even though the drug has no effect under this hypothesis, we might still reject it and approve the drug, but with only 2.5% probability. The probability that we won't make a mistake is this area under this curve, which is 97.5%. So that's what we call size. Uh, and it really has to do with this particular decision diagram here, the fact that we've got a decision to approve or reject a drug, and there are two states of the world. Either the drug is effective or ineffective. So this two-by-two two contingency table basically summarizes what we're trying to accomplish. 